So this book was born of your own experience as well. It seems like a boss wanted to ridicule you in an email chain and, and was kind enough to CC you on that exchange. Yes, uh, I think what happened was he had BCC'd someone ridiculing me and then the person who was BCC'd rep replied, oh, I forgot what happened. It was like one of those weird things where he didn't realize I was gonna be on the thread and all of a sudden I was on the thread. Uh, yeah, so, so I think so much of what we learn about management, we learn from the worst boss we ever had. Sure. And in that case, with that particular boss, I actually lost height. I lost like half an inch or an inch of, and I'm only five feet tall. I yeah. didn't have any height to give because it was so depressing and demoralizing. Working with a bad boss really has a big impact. It, it hurts your ability to get enough sleep. It hurts your ability to feel good about yourself. It has a tremendous impact. And, and that was a big part of why I wrote the book, because so many good people become bad bosses. And then they have a huge negative impact on it. It's like it's, there's managerial leverage, and this mm -hmm. is kind of the opposite, because every boss usually has more than just one direct report. They have five or six. So they're like ruining the lives of five or six people. And it's funny, I really had written off that boss as a horrible human being. Mm -hmm. And fast forward a decade, I bumped into him. We wound up having a glass of wine together. And he wasn't really such a horrible human being. But in his role as boss, yeah. he made me miserable. What do you do in that situation when you get an email? What was your reaction? Aside from actually getting shorter, which I didn't know was possible. <laughs> how, how do you react when you see that? Because I, I saw this in my Feedback Friday inbox where people send me listener questions and there's mm -hmm. stuff like this in there where it's like, I just saw an email thread where the whole management is eviscerating me and what do I even do Yeah, now? yeah. You know, it's really interesting. I think, I mean, at the time, I did the wrong thing. So at the time, I, I just sort of absorbed it. Oh, okay. And I didn't fight back, and which is, I think, why I shrunk half Yeah, it. sure. Uh, and I think it's so tempting to do that because it feels so dangerous to confront that kind of behavior. But as Audre Lorde said, your silence will not protect you. Uh, and so one of the things that, that made me want to write the book was also seeing what happens when people get it right. Mm -hmm. And just watching when people were criticizing me, but criticizing me directly in a way that was helpful was, was a way to understand what makes it right, what's the right response. So the point of radical candor is the right response is to challenge it directly but also in a way that shows you see that other person as another human being. And ideally you care personally, but, but at the very least, you don't sort of write them off as a worthless waste of space on the earth. Uh, you, you see them as a, as a human being, and then you're able to come up with a response that is gonna move things forward. What was the experience that you contrasted with that negative experience where you went, oh, there is a right way to do this? So early on in my career at, at Google, I had to give a presentation to the founders and the CEO about how the ad sets nope. business. No pressure, right? No pressure, no pressure at all. How far above, well, wh where on the food chain were you at this point? Like, were you seeing them every day, working with them, or was it like, hey, you're going up to the top floor, don't blow it? So uh, somewhere in between the two, mm -hmm. the company, at the, I thought it was a big company, but it was maybe 2,000 people, slightly okay. under 2,000 people. So you know, you kind of saw a lot of people. So I reported to Sheryl Sandberg, who reported to Amid Kordistani, who reported to Eric Schmidt. So that was kind of yeah. the, the chain of command, if you will. So it was a big deal, but it wasn't yeah. like a huge, huge It's not like deal. this is your first exposure to no, leadership. No, I, I had already, I had already met them all a couple of times and, and parties and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and you kind of, everybody, it was a very social place, Google at that time. But it was still a big deal. So I walked into the room and there for this important meeting and there in one corner of the room is Sergey Brin, one of the founders on an elliptical trainer pedaling away. During the meeting? Yeah. That's not weird at all. Uh, it was normal for that, but I didn't <laughs> know it was normal. It felt weird, you know, and, and I, I sort of thought, and there's Eric Schmidt, who was CEO at the time, sort of so deep in his email it's like his brain has been plugged into the machine. And so I did feel nervous. I, I was wondered how in the world I was supposed to get these people's attention. They, right. se they seemed to be doing other stuff. And 
it, to be empathetic with them, they were in that room all day long. Sure. Uh, you know, they had to come up with some kind of coping mechanisms for doing all these meetings. But anyway, luckily for me, the business was on fire. And when I said how many new customers the AdSense business had added over the last couple of months, Eric almost fell out of his chair. He said, what did you say? This is incredible. Do you need more engineering resources? Do you need more marketing dollars? How can we help you? Right. So. I'm thinking like the meetings are going all right. In fact, yeah. I now believe I'm a genius. <laughs> and as I walked out of the out of the room, I walked past my boss, and who was Cheryl Sandberg, and she said to me, "Why don't you walk back to my office with me?" Now it's to receive the, my the, pet on the back. The, the of course. ecstasy to the no, I knew. Oh, you I knew? did not. Yeah, I knew something had gone wrong. Uh -oh. And she started out by telling me about the things that had gone well in the meeting, not in a feedback sandwich kind of kick me, kiss me. Oh, the compliment Kiss sandwich. me, yeah, kiss yeah. me, kick me, kiss me. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. That, the compliment that wrong. sandwich is much easier, I guess. Yes, yeah. the compliment sandwich. <laughs> not in that kind of insincere way, but, but actually sure. seeming to mean what she was saying and tell me, telling me some things I didn't know. But of course, all I wanted to know was what did I do wrong? Right. And eventually she said to me, you said um a lot in there. Were you aware of it? And I said, oh yeah, it's no big deal, it's a verbal tick. And meanwhile, I'm breathing this huge sigh of relief because yeah. if that was all I had done wrong, who really cared? And Cheryl looked at me and she said, I know a great speech coach, I bet Google would pay for it. Would you like an introduction? And once again, I made this brush off gesture with my hand. I said, no, I'm busy. I don't have time for a speech coach. Didn't you hear about all those new customers? So now Cheryl's realizing I'm not getting it. So she stops, she looks me right in the eye, and she said, I can see when you do that thing with your hand, I'm gonna have to be a lot more direct with you. When you say um, every third word, it makes you sound stupid. Wow. Now she's got my full attention. Yeah. And some people might say it was mean of Cheryl to say I sounded stupid, but if she hadn't said it to me just that way, using just those words, mm -hmm. and she wouldn't have used those words with somebody else, but she could see she yeah, had you to go were doing a little further. One of yes. these. Yeah. Yeah. And if she hadn't said it using just those words, I never would have gone to see the speech coach. And when I did and watched a video of myself, one of life's more painful situations. Yeah. Please don't make me watch this. But she said I you know, I realized that she was not exaggerating, that Cheryl had not been exaggerating. I literally said um, every third word. Oof. Yeah. yeah. And so, and this was news to me. I had been giving presentations for my entire career. I had raised millions of dollars for a startup giving presentations. I thought I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden I felt like I had been walking through my entire career with a giant hunk of spinach between my teeth and nobody had had the common courtesy to tell me it was there. I could get it out if I knew it was there, but I didn't know it was there. So now I realize that is radical candor. Sure. That was radical. Now, what was it? Then I started thinking, what was it about Cheryl that made it so seemingly easy for her to tell me? But more interestingly, why had no one else told me? Why had no one else told yeah. me? Because it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't like it would crush me. And I realized in the case of Cheryl, the things that, that helped her were basically two simple things. She cared about me, not just as an employee, but as a human being. So she cared personally, but she never let her concern for my short-term feelings get in the way of telling me something that I'd be better off in the long run knowing. So she was willing to challenge me directly. So care personally, challenge directly. Sure. And that became all of life's hardest problems can be boiled down to a good two by two framework. So that became the basis of the radical candor framework. And when you can care personally and challenge directly at the same time, that's radical candor. Very often what happens is we do challenge directly, but we fail to show we care. That's uh -huh. obnoxious aggression. Sure. And I used to call that the asshole quadrant because it's, it seemed more radically right. candid. So if we're looking at this in like a, a two by two grid or matrix, I guess, which yes. is on the cover of the book. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see that on the front of the book, I believe. So you've got the, the obnoxious aggression quadrant is what don't care personally and 
Obnoxious aggression is you don't care personally, but you do challenge. Uh huh. Me. Okay. That that's what I used to call the asshole quadrant, but I really I stopped calling it the asshole quadrant for a very specific reason, because as soon as I did that, people would use the radical candor framework to 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 sort of start writing names in boxes. They mm -hmm. would use it like some kind of new Myers Briggs score, and that's not what this is. Radical candor. Think about it like a compass, not like a not like a judgment. Mm -hmm. And it'll help you move a specific conversation to a good place if you let it. But you need to realize when you're going in the wrong direction. So one wrong direction to go in is you do challenge directly, which is good, but you fail to show you care personally, which is bad. That's obnoxious aggression. Now, very often, and that's what most, most people I think are actually nice people, and most people fear the obnoxious aggression quadrant. Yeah, we don't get honest with people at all generally because of social pressure. We're taught as kids to be nice to other people. We don't want people to dislike us. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest sources of problem uh, in the workplace is something that we all were told from the moment we learned to speak, which is if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Right. And so, and that's really what moves us in the wrong direction on challenge directly. And very often when we realize we've made a mistake and we've landed in obnoxious aggression, instead of moving the right direction on the care personally dimension, we move the wrong direction on challenge directly. Right. So, don't, so. So, so instead of showing we care, we just back off and we say, oh, I didn't really mean what I said or I'm sorry I said what I said or it's no big deal. We kind of issue the false apology. And now we're in the worst place of all where we're not challenging and we're not caring. We're just trying to, you know, we're now. Make it go away. Yeah, we're now worried about our own reputation mm -hmm. and the impact on us. We're worried that we have been a jerk instead of worrying about the impact we've had on this other person. And, and we wind up in this quadrant that I call manipulative insincerity. And that's where backstabbing behavior, political behavior, the false apology, passive aggressive behavior, all that bad stuff happens there. And it's fun to tell stories about obnoxious aggression and manipulative insincerity. Yeah. Let's... Because that's like the stuff of drama in the workplace. Right. But the vast majority of people make the vast majority of mistakes when they do care personally, but they're so worried about hurting somebody's feelings that they don't tell them something they'd be better off knowing. And this last mistake is what I call ruinous empathy. And that's what often kills us. And, and we're, we're often, we're not trying to be mean. We're actually trying to be nice when we're being ruinously empathetic. We're just failing. It's just that we're failing slowly. So for me, to explain to you what I mean by ruinous sympathy, you want me, can I tell you another yeah, story? Yeah, let's or do it. Do you have yeah. another question? Stories are great. No, we can go into these. Okay. So to explain to you what I mean by ruinous sympathy, I want to tell you probably the worst moment of my career. So I just hired this guy. We'll call him Bob. Really liked Bob. Smart. He was charming. He was funny. And he, he, would, he would do stuff like we were at a manager offsite and we were playing one of those endless get to know you games that everybody hates but feels guilty Bounce for saying. Yeah, for the yeah, yeah, trust something. ball, whatever. <laughs> and Bob's, Bob was the guy who had the courage to say, look, we're all really busy, but we all really like each other. I've got an idea that'll help us get to know each other and it'll be really fast. We were down with really fast, whatever it was. And he said, let's just go around the table and tell one another what candy our parents used when potty training us. Weird, but fast. We all, even weirder yet, we all I remember. I know that. Hershey Kisses right here. I oh, remember. That's, we that's all remember. dangerously yeah. close to yeah. <laughs> the activity at hand. Yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then for the next 10 months, every time there's a tense moment in a meeting, Bob would whip out just the right piece of candy for the right person at the right moment. Wow. <laughs> so, so, Weird, but quirky and funny. Yeah. You know, a source of levity around the office. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved working with Bob. One problem with Bob, he was doing terrible work. Oh. He would hand stuff in to me and there was shame in his eyes. I was so puzzled, I couldn't understand it because he had this incredible resume, this great history of accomplishments. And I, I learned later the problem was that 
Bob had taken up a new habit of smoking pot in the bathroom every <laughs> four, four hours. Oh, wow. Which maybe explained all that candy. Yeah, uh, that, yeah that's a good point. <laughs> but I didn't know any of that time, any of that at the time. All I knew was that Bob was doing terrible work. And, but I, I also knew that Bob was kind of a sensitive guy and that he was well loved in the office. And I was afraid if I told him in no uncertain terms that his work wasn't nearly good enough, he would get upset. Yeah. And so I didn't tell him. So you just let it ride. I just, I would say something like, oh, Bob, this is a great start. Maybe you could make it a little better. You're so smart. Everybody loves working with you. And of course he never did. And this goes on for 10 months. And eventually- It's a long time. It's a long time. And everybody else is having to cover for him and redo his work. And eventually the inevitable happens. And I realize if I don't fire Bob, I'm gonna lose all my best performers. Because it's not fair to them that they're having to do their job and his too. And so I sit down to have a conversation with Bob that I should have started 10 months previously. And he kind of listens and then he pushes the chair back from the table and he says, why didn't you tell me? Yikes. And as that question is going around in my head with no good answer, mm. he says, why didn't anyone tell me? I thought you all cared about me. And now I realize I'd been trying to be nice to Bob. And in fact, I'd been cruel because now I'm having to fire him because I haven't told him. I've failed him right. in a bunch of different ways. I've failed to solicit feedback from him. I haven't, I haven't asked him. Maybe I was doing something that was driving him so crazy he was forced to toke up in the bathroom. Huh. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, or he's got some personal issue. He, obviously, he thought he was getting away with smoking pot in the bathroom yeah. and probably thought, like, I like this. Work's more fun now. Yeah. Or, hey, I have some stressful thing going on in my life. I can medicate with marijuana and I'm still doing well enough. Nobody, they would have told me these are all people that care about yeah. me. They would have told me. If Meanwhile, nobody wanted an awkward five minutes, so now he's got to go find another career. Yeah, Oof. yeah. And, the th- and, it, and it, if I'm honest with myself, part of the reason why I didn't tell him was, was ruinous empathy. I, I, I really did care about him and didn't want to hurt his feelings. But the harsher underlying reality is also there was some manipulative insincerity there. Hmm. Because everybody liked Bob. Bob was sensitive. And I was worried not only about his feelings, but my reputation. If I told him in no uncertain terms that his work wasn't nearly good enough, what happened if he got upset? What, you know, it's a big open office space. What, what happened if he even started to cry? Now everybody's gonna think I'm a big you know what. Mm-hmm. And so I'm worried about Bob and his feelings, but I'm also, and that's the ruinous empathy part, sure. but I'm also worried about my own reputation and that's the manipulative insincerity. Part. Yikes, because we don't want people to dislike us, I get that, but it builds this resentment over time or certainly after you fire them for something where they thought like, this is out of nowhere. Yeah, how did this happen? Yeah. So we end up avoiding the person, right, entirely? Yes. And yeah, people have got to cover for their work. Then then everyone else actually thinks, I can't believe Kim is giving me Bob's crap. This is like three months I'm still doing Bob's job. And they're not telling me that. Right. You know, because it's hard to speak truth to power. I was the CEO. And so it was like a feedback-free zone. Yeah. Everybody's getting more and more mad, except Bob, who's blissfully ignorant. But it's not so blissful in the end because he gets fired, right? Oh, man. It was, it's terrible. Yeah. So you're drawing this, this line between a lack of guidance and then you've got poor results on top of it. And then yeah. you've got to let you lose a team member. Because obviously he was there at some point he was qualified for the job. Mm-hmm. So instead of making a minor 10 degree shift three times and getting him back on track or five degree shift, now you just literally have to unplug it. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a mess. Yeah, and it was, I mean, even Bob at this point agreed that he should go mm-hmm. because there was so much water under the bridge and so much resentment from the team. It was too late to fix it. Right. It was, and that was the hardest part, worse for Bob than for me, but it was so hard for both of us because maybe we could have fixed it if we had had this conversation 10 months previously, mm-hmm. but now it felt too late to fix. And all I could do in the moment was make myself a very solemn promise that I would never make that mistake again. And that's really why I wrote Radical Candor and came up with this framework. 
you have in the book, you've got two or you have multiple categories of people, two of them rock stars versus superstars. I like that everyone's a star. Even the falling stars are yes. still stars. That's That was very nice of you. Can we talk about what these are? Because that nuanced difference between those, I think, is really important. Yes, I'd love to talk about it, but can I make a slight correction? Let's do it. So, so I really like to avoid putting labels on people. Mm -hmm. and I think Despite that, this, this being the labeling section of but, your well, book. It's, but, but, it's, but I, I, maybe I wasn't careful enough in the book. I tried to be pretty careful in the way I wrote it to say you're in rock star mode or superstar mode. Gotcha. I may have missed a couple of edits. Yeah, these notes are. But the rock star super. Well, we all do this. We all say, oh, you know, I am ra radically candid. I'm not radically candid. Sometimes I am. Sometimes I'm obnoxiously aggressive. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm manipulatively insincere. Sometimes I'm... These are mistakes we all make. Sure. And rock star mode and superstar mode are two modes you can... Two very different modes you can be in in your career. And all of us are in one of those modes at different times in our career. So, but let's talk about the difference it, between It makes sense, mode right? Yeah, sure. Course. We're not always gonna be A performers. An A student doesn't never get a B, they just get a lot of A's, right, so. Yeah, yeah. And to say someone is an A student, like, they're, they're much more and much less than that, mm -hmm. all at the same time. Sure. Um, so, rock star mode and superstar mode. It's a, it's it sounds so confusing. Like, what in the world could be the difference? Yeah, that, like okay, the way to pick two labels that are really similar sounding. Yes, yes. So it was an executive that I worked with at Apple who explained the difference to me, and what she said was, on every high performing team, you need rock stars and superstars, and they need very different things, and so you have to manage them very differently. And I, and I sort of said, what in the world could the difference be? And people, when they're in, and so this is now, there was some labeling, even in the way I just said sure. that, so I made the same mistake. But when people are in rock star mode, they are in a mode where they're great at their job, but they don't necessarily want the next big job. Mm -hmm. They're just great at their job and they're content to do it for a long time. Whereas when people are in superstar mode, they're equally great at their job, but they're kind of, they kind of have an eye for the next job. They're on a steep growth trajectory. So th there's another two by two. I love the two by two. It's yeah, it's your a thing. way to analyze things. But so there's your growth trajectory and, and, and sort of your performance. And when you're a great performer, but on a gradual growth trajectory, for a moment in your career, you are in rock star mode. But when you're, a great, when, you're, when you're doing great work, when your performance is fantastic, but you're on a steep growth trajectory at that moment in time, then you're in superstar mode. And what, so what, is a, what does someone in rock star mode look like? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, sometimes it's because a person is in rock star mode because they've gotten really good at their job, but there's some outside interest, something outside of work that is more important to them than getting the next big job. So for a while when I was at Google, I was writing a novel. And so I was kind of in rock star mode, I, I think, uh, because oh, I, I, I was yeah. really good at the job, I think, but I wasn't really gunning for the next big job. And other times you have, you're starting a family, and that can be a reason why, why a person mm -hmm. goes into rock star mode. Or Einstein in the patent office was really, he was, I'm sure, decent at his job in the patent office, but he was great. You know, he, he wanted that job because he wanted to leave at 5 o'clock, go home, and, and work on the general theory of relativity. <laughs> right. You know, Talk and, about an outside interest. Yeah, know. yeah. And, and what would the world have been a better place if instead of going home at five o'clock and, and working on the general theory of relativity, uh, if instead- Put in an extra couple put, hours. Yeah, yeah. To, to get to, to the next rung on the ladder in the patent office, right. not so much. Uh, and and will, would the world be a better place if, you know, if when you're starting a family, you neglect your children to get to, not necessarily. So, so you, you wanna make, sh and some people can do, some people can have, you know, do the general theory of relativity and be a great parent and get to the next rung on the ladder. But Maybe. not all of us can do that. Not all of us, certainly not me. And the fact of the matter is, on a team, you want to balance growth and stability. You actually, even if you could have 100% of your employees in 
superstar mode, you wouldn't necessarily want that because... Too competitive in the workplace? Well, people are always moving. Like, there's a great deal of benefit to having some people who are good at the job, great at the job, who, who are so great at it that they can teach others to be great at it as well. They continue to make those incremental changes uh, that, that improve things, but they're not spending tons of time and eff effort catapulting themselves mm -hmm. to the next level. And you, you need stability as well as growth on a team. If it's all growth all the time, the wheels tend to come off the bus. Probably makes for happier employees too. Like my outside interest, my particle physics theories are taking a major backseat to this podcast recently. But I mean, I think most of us want people that are going to be stable in our in positions, especially key positions. I don't necessarily want somebody who's really great at one thing trying to move up to management. It's like, no, I rely on you for this. Yes. If you change, yeah, it's good for you, but like, uh, uh, I don't know, is it good for the rest of us? Maybe not. Well, I, th I think when you're a manager, you're, you're responsible to help the person get what they want. Sure. And not to hold them back. Sure. If they want, if they, if they, if a person wants to be in superstar mode and you're trying to hold them back, you're trying to clip their wings, you're making a mistake because you're going to lose that person and and you're going to create unnecessary friction and tension. Uh, at the same time, if somebody's really happy in their rock star mode and you're trying to push them to be something they don't want to be and to do stuff they don't want to do, mm -hmm. you're also not benefiting that person or the team. So I think it's really important as the leader to First and foremost, understand where people are and where they want to go and what's important to them. And then to try to design jobs that accommodate for that. But of course, you can't always. And there's no right ratio. There's no one right ratio. You know, you need 20% of your people in superstar mode and 80% of your people in rock star mode. It's different. Different industries are different. Different, different companies are different, they're different moments in time. But I think the important thing is to be very clear on the difference and to, to offer equal respect to, super, to people in superstar mode and rockstar mode. You need both. And I think especially in Silicon Valley where I had so much of my career, there's, there's a bias to superstar mode and, and not sufficient value given to the people who create the stability that keep the wheels on the bus. Yeah, there's a culture here, and I know that this might be compatible in many ways. Of At, at Apple, for example, you mentioned in the book, we hire people that tell us what to do. We want to hire people and have them come in and bring these fresh ideas, but often I think that you, and that's great. I hire people that direct me too. I like that. But sometimes you just have to have people that are going to be standby in that role and work really well in that role. Yeah, and I think it's equally important that you allow your people who are when they're in when they're in rock star mode to tell you what to do too, because mm -hmm. they know how to do the job. They might know even better than they yeah. definitely know better than you. Yeah, <laughs> if, certainly know better than me, but possibly better than somebody who's on an upward trajectory and is looking at the next target. Yeah, they're not paying as much attention right. to to that particular. Role. And there's certain roles that lend themselves more to people in rock star mode. And there's certain roles that lend themselves. If something's changing all the time, mm -hmm. it, it lends itself more to a to superstar mode because people need to embrace that change and want to learn the new thing. And uh, uh, whereas when you're in when when you're in rock star mode, you, you want you've achieved a certain level of mastery and now you're kind of reaping the dividends sure. from that level. Of yeah, I'm thinking of things like marketing or digital marketing where somebody, if they're really good at Facebook ads, that's great. But if it's Facebook, hey, this isn't converting as well as our LinkedIn stuff now. And they go, well, I don't know. I kind of just do Facebook. It's like, well, we really need somebody who's just going to be a digital marketer and go to where the blue ocean is yeah. and nail that and wants to stay up and hungrily learn about Instagram TV or whatever yeah. the newest thing is. Yeah. Not just somebody who's like, but I got my ads dialed in on Facebook. It's like, yeah, yeah and they work 10% as they did three years ago. Yeah. 
Yeah. We kind of want a superstar mode person yeah. in this. Like flip the switch or maybe we have to bring in somebody else who's going to cover right. that. Right. Yeah. I, I know that the you've written that workplaces are yearning for candid bosses and yet bosses continue falling short. So how do we how do we start to roll in that direction if we find ourselves in ruinous empathy, manipulative insincerity, obnoxious aggression? Mm -hmm. like how do we correct course? Because I'm I for sure see myself never really in ruinous empathy, probably unfortunately, <laughs> but certainly in manipulative insincerity where I'm like, you know, I could have this conversation, but I'm just being a broken record and I don't feel like it and they should know and all these other things I tell myself yeah. that are just BS excuses for me to like not deal with it. Yeah. Or I sent him an email about this like six months ago. He knows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. An obnoxious aggression where I go into it and then I go, shoot, I need to send an apology, don't I? And then my wife goes, I mean, I would. You know, yeah. you don't have to, but I would. And I go, I know what that means. Yeah, right? yeah. How do I correct course? How do so, we correct course? So I think the most, there's kind of an order of operations to this. Mm -hmm. The first thing to do is to really dial in the way that you solicit feedback. Okay. Because I, I think one of the mistakes that I've made, if I can be radically candid with myself, sure. one of the mistakes that I've made is telling too many stories about how bosses are giving feedback to employees. And that's not what rad that's not the place to start with radical candor. The place to start is with soliciting it. And that's true no matter what your role is. That's true whether you're the boss or the peer or the employee. The, the right place to start is asking what you could do or stop doing that would that would make it easier to work with you. And there's there's an art to soliciting feedback because nobody wants to give you feedback. And so you've kind of got to drag it out of people. Right. And I think there are four things you can focus on. The first is really dialing in your question. If you say, do you have any feedback for me? You're wasting your breath. Because mm -hmm. I can already tell you what the answer is. Oh no, everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 99 times out of 100, that's the answer. I remember bosses asking me that. It's like you're in there with HR for like a performance review and there's two partners at this law firm that I used to work at. There's two partners or one partner. Do you have any feedback on the summer program? Of course not. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. How's yeah. that? I yeah. loved every minute of it. Does that check the box? Yeah. What am I gonna say? Like, you never gave me any work. You couldn't have cared less that I was here. Yeah. I generally hate working with most of these people because they're self-absorbed and miserable. Right. No, I'm gonna <laughs> tell you it was amazing because I want a job offer. Like, give me a break. Yeah, yeah. So so they didn't really yeah. take the time to figure out how to ask you in a way that was gonna elicit. No, it was ludicrous. So, so first of all, they didn't ask the right question. So, and if I could give you one right question, I would, but there's not. There, there are two things that the question needs to accomplish. Well, there's a lot of things, but one, two important things. First of all, it needs to sound like it's coming from, from you, not from me. And second of all, it needs to put the other person in a frame of mind that they're gonna answer. So for example, my personal favorite question is, what could I do or stop doing that would make it easier to work with me. Mm. But I worked with one person who told me that that question to them sounded very, uh, like I didn't really want to hear an answer because it was too abstract mm. and too big. So I needed, for that person, I needed to ask more specific questions. So you've got to figure out what works for you, but also what works for the other person. So figure out the way you're going to ask for feedback. And then the next thing I think you need to do is you, you you really need to embrace the discomfort. Like you've just put, when you ask somebody for feedback, you've put them in an uncomfortable situation. Oh yeah. And you need to actually make it more uncomfortable and more uncomfortable until they give you an answer. So like in the case of the law firm, what huh. they could have done is, that's not, I want, what I want, what I want from you is not praise, I want criticism. Tell me. Right. What like could have been better? Force it out of me. Like you have to give me some negative feedback or some criticism. You have to pick one. If you had to pick one thing, what would it yeah. be? That would have come up with something. Yeah. So you got to. You've got to embrace the discomfort. Right. And, and I think it's maybe those lawyers were really just being ruinously empathetic with you. Maybe they they saw that you were uncomfortable, 
you gave them all this positive stuff and they didn't want to make you more uncomfortable but, but it is you you have to embrace the discomfort of I think they wanted to feel permission to then unload on me because that's what happened after in this particular example it was oh okay good well here's like a huge laundry list of things that we don't like but oh no 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 we're still giving you a job offer we just really hope you don't take it basically is where that ended up Ugh. yeah it was terrible that's a, that's all they actually ended up getting i wouldn't say getting in trouble but when i told career services back at my school who had placed me in this job that or helped me get the job yeah placed me in the job about that meeting because I was like hey I think I'm like really screwed and never going to get a career and they're like what happened and I told them and they were like whoa they're not supposed to do any of that one it's bad management and two they're not supposed to give you these like fake job offers they're supposed to give you real feedback so you can improve and then additionally they're supposed to not give you an offer if you're not a fit but they do this at law firms and I don't know if this is also in Silicon Valley they do this at law firms because they want to be able to say, we had 16 summer interns. We gave 100% offers, so you should come work for us next summer because oh, everyone gets a job offer, so there's no uncertainty in you coming to work with us. Wow. So they give you the offer, but then they're so mean to you that it's, Yeah. It's like, we'll every... give you the offer, but you probably won't work in our New York office even though everyone else is going to get a job there. You might have to work in our... Uh, White Lake office, which is where we do all of our document review for all these litigations that never go anywhere. And you'll be in a basement by yourself yeah. and the pay might be slightly lower. Wow. And, you know, they just kind of keep laying it on until you go, oh, OK, I'm not taking the job. Calm offer. down. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I've never heard of that. It's actually. called a cold offer. A cold. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I didn't. I, I did the smart thing and did not take it. And I ended up going working office. for an amazing law firm that didn't tell me that I was basically not fit to be <laughs> breathing wow. their oxygen. Wow! Wow! That's awful. Mm. That's awful. Yeah, it was really bad. And a lot of the feedback that I got was things that had happened like months prior. So they didn't give you feedback in the in the moment. No. And I saw that when I was reading Radical Candor, I was like, oh, this would have been really helpful because no earlier. I didn't. I started getting really lame assignments or not enough. And I was like, hey, is everything OK? And they're like, yeah, we're just really busy. Your group is really busy. And I'm like, that should mean I'm getting more work, not none. Yeah. And then it was like, oh, well, you have to talk to this person about it. Oh, no, we're it's fine. It's great. And then other people would, there were all these little things like that. Wow. And then it would be like, hey, three months ago when we went out to lunch, you did something that nobody can remember, including you. And that somehow turned off one of the associates. And we don't know, but don't that's do that why, again. That's why we didn't. We don't know it, what it was. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it was stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, these are all great examples for giving feedback. Right. Let's continue to dig in. Sure. On, they, they failed to give and they failed to solicit. That's right. So so we talked about two things for soliciting. Come up with the right question. Embrace the discomfort. Next, the thing that they should have done when soliciting feedback from you uh, is to listen with the intent to understand, not to respond. Mm -hmm. Because once you've embraced the discomfort, you've gotten something out of someone. And it's, it may not be a huge thing, but you've dragged them out on a conversational limb they never wanted to go on in the first place. And now they've told you something that you probably didn't really want to hear, if you're honest with yourself. Yeah. And so it's vital that you not get defensive. It's vital that you listen with the intent to understand, not to respond. Uh, but you're still not done with soliciting feedback, because if you ever want to get it again, if you want to build a relationship, You've got to reward the candor. And that's pretty easy if you agree with the feedback. You fix the problem, and you tell the person how you fixed the problem, and you ask them if you went far enough to fix the problem, and hopefully you're good. Sometimes you're going to disagree with the feedback. And if all you do is say, thank you for the feedback, the person is going to hear, you know, F you. Yeah, uh, sure. That's, that, it doesn't, that's a good point. Yeah. And so what you need to do is you need to take a look at what was said, and you need to find something in what was said that you can agree with. Disagreement is rarely 100% disagreement. Mm -hmm. uh, so find that 5 or 10% of what was said that you can agree with to demonstrate that you're really listening. You want to make your listening tangible. And then say, for the rest, I want to think about it and get back to you. And do go and get back to them and explain why you disagree in a sort of calm, non-defensive, rational way. And at some point, you got to listen, challenge, commit. But in other words, you don't want to argue endlessly. But 
Often a disagreement, although it's uncomfortable, can deepen a relationship. But ignoring a person or making them feel visible for giving you, especially when you've asked for feedback and you know now you're just pretending like it never happened, mm -hmm. like that never deepens a relationship. Sure. So, so those are the four steps to soliciting feedback. And, and, you know, I mean, let's go back to that experience. Like, you knew something was wrong. Sure, yeah. You knew something was wrong, and you knew they weren't telling you. And they were being manipulatively insincere. But what could you have done to drag them up to radical candor, or even drag them over to obnoxious aggression? Yeah. Because that would have been better. I think it would have been better. I don't know. I mean, I was, like, 24, so I was yeah. really scared. But yeah. um, I think re looking back now at 39, I should have said, well, I'm not getting any work here. And so what I need to know is why that's happening. Either I'm not aggressively pushing for the work or people don't want to give it to me. Mm -hmm. And I need to figure out which one it is because right now I'm not growing at all. I'm not learning anything. Yeah. And so I need to figure out exactly what's going on. Do you have any idea? And if not you, do you know who here would have any idea? Something like that. Yeah. They yeah. would have had to be like, fine. You know why? Nobody likes you. You're a little yeah. punk. Everyone thinks you got your head up your ass. Yeah. Whatever. That would have been better than, no, Nothing. it's just, just everyone's just yeah. really busy with their own project. Yeah. I don't know. Workflow has been slow. Yeah. Whatever sort of BS. And because I knew something was wrong because it was one day it would be, well, workflow is really slow. And then, oh, everyone's really busy with their own stuff. Oh, and da -da. it's like, well, OK, if there's either too, no work or there's too much. Yeah. It's not both. Yeah. Yeah. So what the hell? Yeah. And I think when you're in that situation, it's so hard. I mean, it's so easy for us to talk about, like, looking back. Yeah, hindsight is twenty. Yeah, yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. When you're in the situation, it's incredibly hard. But if, if, if some of your listeners are in this situation, I think the one thing to do when you want to solicit, when you want to figure out what's going wrong, is to make sure that you're opening yourself up. Mm -hmm. Like, I believe I'm not getting any work because I did something wrong, but I don't know what I did wrong. Can you help me? Right? So now all of a sudden you're, you're sort of lowering the other person's defense. Because remember, when, when you're asking someone for feedback, they don't want to give you feedback for the same reason you don't want to give other people feedback because right. they're afraid that you're going to make their life miserable sure. if they tell you yeah. <laughs> what it was. Uh, and and so you've got to make sure that you're you're doing whatever you can to say I'm I'm not blaming you because I'm getting no work. My concern is that I've done something wrong, and I really want to know what I did wrong so I can fix it. Will you help me? And you mentioned in the book that radical candor is never personal. Sheryl Sandberg didn't say you're stupid. She said you sound stupid. Yeah. Well. So it's not personal is actually a phrase I recommend you just eliminate from okay. your vote because it is personal. It's personal, yeah. Uh, I guess it's not a label as much as a... Yeah, but you, but you don't want to make it about a personality attribute. Right, there so, you go. So, so it's, it's very new. It's surprisingly nuanced. It sounds so easy. It's mm -hmm. like there's two things and there's four quadrants, but, but the, there's a big difference between telling someone don't take it personally, mm -hmm. uh, and actually caring personally. <laughs> right? right. So, so when when you say don't take it personally, you're sort of dismissing someone's emotions. You're sort of saying you shouldn't be feeling the way you feel, and that's that's a useless thing to say. Like, the thing to do when someone's feeling upset is to acknowledge how they feel, and to say, I can see you're upset. I'm sorry you're upset. How can I say this? But I'm trying to help you. How can I say this in a way that? Yeah, I think yeah. it's it's also it's okay if someone's upset about it in the beginning, at least as long as it's effective. Well, right? uh, I mean, look, it's normal. We're we're human beings, yeah. and we have emotions, and most of us spend more time at work than we do in the, any other part of our lives, and so it is. It's normal if you learn that you've screwed up. It's normal to feel upset. Yeah. And that's okay. It's okay. It's, we've got to, like, communication happens on a logical plane, but it also happens on an emotional sure. plane. And when you're, giving, when you're giving feedback to someone, it's so important to be able and willing to communicate both on the emotional plane and on the, the rational plane. 
And if you say don't take it personally, you're, you're sort of saying, I don't care about you personally, <laughs> really. Uh -huh. uh, so you're like, fa as soon as you say that, you're failing on the care personally dimension. Whereas if you say, if you can acknowledge, the, it's uncomfortable. We'd all rather never have any emotions, sure. especially at work, but we do have them. So it's uncomfortable to say, I can see you're upset. But I th it's, and it's tricky because you don't want to imagine, if you're giving someone feedback, that you control their emotions. Because you don't. Like, you can't, you don't get to manage my emotions. Only I get to manage mm -hmm. my emotions. But you can say something that's going to that's gonna have an impact on me, that might elicit an emotion. I'm still responsible for the emotion, but it might elicit emotion. And that doesn't mean that if I start to cry because you tell me I sounded stupid in the meeting, that doesn't mean it's your fault that I started to cry. But it does mean if we're having a conversation that you have a responsibility for seeing the emotion and caring. Yeah, sure. I, I understand that. And I think a lot of times we avoid this because we want people to like us rather than because, and we'll say, I don't want this person to feel bad or I don't want to hurt their feelings. But then it's really about us, right? It's yeah. not about them because we're thinking, like what you do with Bob, it was like, well, I don't want to hurt Bob's feelings. Yeah. I want him to work well with the team. Well, he's not working well with the team. Yeah. So now we, we've made a choice between caring about Bob and making it about us being liked by Bob so that we can go to lunch. Yeah, and, and I think also it's really important, like I, I don't want to totally eliminate empathy from the equation. Sure, of course. It's front stabbing instead of backstabbing. Well, <laughs> I think I think obnoxious aggression is front stabbing. Front stabbing? There's okay. No, and backstabbing is manipulative insincere. Got it. So in neither one of those cases is there a lot of care personally. But in ruinous sympathy, there is a lot of care personally, and that's a good thing. I don't want to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. I just want to channel it to a better place where you're both caring and challenging. And very often the reason we don't challenge someone, we don't offer them some criticism, is that we know it's gonna hurt their feelings. And it will, like it, mm -hmm. they pro Bob probably would have gotten upset <laughs> if I had told him. But the point is, is it gonna be more upsetting if I don't tell him, don't tell him, don't tell him, and then fire him, than if I just tell him now? Sure. <laughs> so so it, it's part of, part of the problem, I think, with empathy is that it, it's very focused on the one moment. And compassion, on the other hand, is like a bigger picture uh, way to approach it. And so the compassionate thing for Bob would have been to tell him because I would have been able to see beyond the moment. Sometimes you can get paralyzed by empathy, but I, I could have seen beyond the moment to what, what's the longer term impact on Bob going to be of not telling him. What about the, the compliment sandwich that everyone talks about? What do you think about that? I think it, it usually, there's no always to any of this, mm -hmm. but it usually is a disaster. The reason why the shit sandwich is such a problem is that it usually, not always, but it usually uh, winds up with very insincere praise and harsh criticism. So it's like, I love your haircut, your podcast sucks, but those boots are great. Uh, like yeah. that's not, your, your podcast doesn't suck, by the way. I, I wouldn't be here if it did, it's yeah, awesome. So far so good. Um, and your <laughs> boots are genuinely great and I really do like your hair. This is a great but, compliment sandwich so far. <laughs> What's wrong with this thing again? <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. But so, so one of the problems with the feedback sandwich is that the, the praise is often insincere sure. and meaningless. It's about unimportant things. Oh, right. I think the other bigger, more fundamental problem with it is that it, it, sort, of, it, it sort of taps into this confusion about praise and criticism. I think one mistake a lot of people make is they think that praise is the way they show they care and criticism is the way they challenge directly. But good praise should both show you care, but it should also challenge the person to do more of what's sure. good. And good criticism should challenge, but it should also care. And so, so praise, I think, sometimes there's almost like a false dichotomy between praise and criticism. They're not so very different, actually. They're both trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to guide the person to a better place. Uh, and and also to be guided to a better place. Like the reason why I call it candor and not truth 
is that candor to me kind of implies, here's what I see, what do you see? Let's talk about it. Whereas truth kind of implies, I have a pipeline to God. Right. You don't know shit from Shinola. And that's not a great place to start a conversation from. What is this fly down technique? Your fly is down technique? This seems yes. like a good option here. So, so I think one of the things that's hard in the moment about, about offering radical candor or soliciting it is that the topic can be very emotional, but if you, and that can sort of paralyze you. Mm -hmm. But if you try to think of a simpler situation, like if you have a really hard math problem and you can't figure out how to solve it, it can be much easier to solve it if you think of a similar math problem but an easier one. So let's say, uh, let's say that I wanna, I wanna give you some really tricky feedback. You do not have BO, but let's pretend that you okay. do for the purposes of this. Sure. I want to tell you that you have BO. That's hard. And so if I think about an easier situation, like let's say I want to tell you that you have spinach in your teeth, what's the right thing to do? Yeah, just do That's it. That's easy. I know that if I don't tell you, it's not nice because then you're going to go to your next meeting and you're still going to have spinach in your teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I know the right thing to do is to tell you and, and not to like, broadcast it, not to tell you in an obnoxious way, but to say, you know. Yeah, not on Twitter. Yeah, I have a gap in between my teeth and I often have spinach there and I'm not aware of it. And I really appreciate it when people tell me, so do you mind if I tell you that you have spinach, whatever. And so you know, you take an easy example like, so, so if I'm faced with a much harder situation, like you have body odor, I pretend that it's spinach. Right, so the whole, your fly is down. I would tell anyone that, even if it's a little awkward, because they'll yeah. go, you know they're gonna appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you're telling someone, hey, when you give a presentation and you said you know 58 times, it was really distracting. You think, I don't know if I wanna do that. You have to think about it as, what if his fly was down? Yeah. Would I tell him? Yes. Of course I would. Okay, it's the same situation. Yeah, and there's, of course, a little tweak of nuance because sometimes these things are not as black and white as spinach in the teeth. Sure. Or, I mean, the fly's down or it's not down, and you're pretty sure you're right if it's down. Right, yeah, you gotta, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're pretty sure this is not the way these genes were designed, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but sometimes you'll be giving someone some, you'll, you'll see something and you think it's a problem. You think, the, you think that they lost credibility in the meeting because they said, you know, 58 mm -hmm. times, but maybe you're wrong. Maybe it didn't really matter to the other people. Maybe it only bothered you. But you still want to tell them what you, what you think you saw. You just want to make sure you're humble about it. Like, here's what I think. I could be wrong. I think another reason why people often fail to give feedback is they think they have to be 100% right and they have to have the answer. And if that's the standard, then there's a lot of things that we're not going to tell each other. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I like that because I think it is easier to use an analogy kind of in the moment or um, to, to really think, would this person want to hear this if it were something else that's really similar? Yeah. And even if you're wrong, they might go, you know, I said you know a lot, and even though I just did it there as a filler word, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. I'm going to watch the video. You know what? That person's crazy. They just have a thing for that phrase. Fine. But it's better to, I'd rather get feedback that turns out to be wrong than not get feedback that turned out to be career limiting yeah. or something along yeah. those lines. Well, exactly. And the other, feedback is a gift in one of two ways. It's either a gift, of, I mean, specifically criticism is a gift in one of two ways. It's either a gift because I'm right and by telling you, I give you the opportunity to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Or it's a gift because I'm wrong but only by telling you what I think do I give you the opportunity to correct my thinking. Right. And as long as you offer it in, in, in that spirit, it's the beginning of a, of a conversation and it's not this sort of harsh Especially thing. if it's your boss, because even if they just have a weird quirk for the phrase you know, do you want to be giving presentations for the next three years and kind of grading your nails on your boss's personal chalkboard yeah. every single time? Yeah, no, probably not. figure out another filler word. Yeah. If you're gonna replace it with something else, fine. As long as your boss isn't going, I just can't stand listening to him talk. Yes. Right, you don't want that. What if we have to give radical candid feedback to our boss, somebody above us, instead of somebody that's working underneath us? Is it different? So the order of operations is always the same. Solicit okay. the feedback first, and then, 
focus on the good stuff, offer praise. Okay. And then you want to offer criticism, but start in a gentle way. Ask. Mm -hmm. I'm, I want to tell you something that's bothering me is now a good time. And that's true whether it's your boss, your employee, or your peer, or your spouse, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so that's the next order of operation. And then it's so important to gauge the response that you get from the other person so that you can adjust. I think very often people think of feedback or radical candor. They think it's like this, I'm going to deliver you these words mm -hmm. and I'm done. And that's not how it works. I'm going to say this thing to you, and now I need to observe how you respond. And if you respond by getting mad or sad, if you, if you have an emotional response, the right thing for me to do is to attend to the care personally dimension. Now I've gotten an emotion, and it's not, it's not, again, it's not necessarily a bad thing that I've gotten an emotional response. It may just mean that you care a lot about your work, and mm -hmm. when you see something is going well or it's going well but you're, you've got you need to do that 10 more times in order to succeed or it's going badly and you need to fix it that's hard so getting an emotional response does not mean you've failed it just means you, you need to move up on the care personally dimension you need to say i can see you're frustrated it seems like you're frustrated how can i help or whatever but a lot of the time, what you'll get is sort of what I did to Cheryl, this brush off, mm -hmm. where, where the person says, yeah, 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 I know. I'll, you know, it's no big deal, though. And it's very tempting in those moments to stop. Like, I, I did what I was supposed to do. I told him if he chose to ignore me. That's you know, on him, yeah. Yeah, that, that, or if she chose to ignore me, that's on her. And, and that's when you need to attend to the challenge directly dimension. And sometimes when you're giving feedback to someone, and I'm sure Cheryl felt this way when giving feedback to me, she's probably thinking, do I really have to pick up a two by four and hit him right. on the head? But yes, actually, I mean, not literally, she didn't actually have to hit me, but she had to keep going. She had to keep moving out on that, on that challenge directly dimension. And that's what's so hard is figuring out, is this my moment? that I need to attend to care personally, or is this the moment when I need to attend to challenge directly? Do you think her next step would have been something like, okay, clearly this is not going through. I'm hiring you as speech coach. You are going to this coach, and it has to happen because you can't keep giving presentations where you do this. Like, what do you think, what's the if, if next? I still, if I still, yeah. at, even after she said, when you say um, every third word, it makes you, you sound, sound stupid. stupid. No, I don't. That's all in your head. Like, it, yeah, you know. and, and actually it's interesting. I've gotten, I've gotten a number of people sent me articles about how these filler words are a good thing. And Sure, you can find some, I, yeah. something to back up <laughs> any bad habit that you have, I'm sure. Something to, or, or you can find something to learn in the situation. You know, I think in, in cases where you really do try, you go pretty far out on mm -hmm. challenge directly, and the person's still not hearing you, you have an important decision to make. Uh, I, I think you can either let that person fail and see it for themselves, like sometimes school of hard knocks will get through to mm -hmm. them when you can't. And, and I, I think in, if Cheryl had done that, it, it would have hurt my career. And I, I might not have under, ever understood why. So, you know, but she would have at least tried. I think another thing you can do is decide that in order for me to get through to this person, I'm going to have to go so far out on challenge directly that I'm going to have to cross a line I'm not willing to cross. I, I once had somebody working for me who really would not, I, I tried all, is I tried as hard as I could to get through, and the person just thought, just didn't believe me that hmm. this was a problem. And I decided in that case that for me to break through the defenses, I was going to risk like hurting the person in some sort of fundamental way, like psychologically. <laughs> there might be some, and I decided the better thing to do was to part ways. Wow. Uh, but but so, so radical candor, you won't always get through. You can't always get through, but. At, at least I felt like I had done everything I could possibly do to get through to them before I fired them. 
What about this concept of loud listening? I like that. It's like trying to get a reaction out of other people that's constructive. So at one point in my career, I had uh, so someone came to me and said, you need to just be quiet. You need to be quiet more in meetings. You need to be like so-and-so, some other leader. So I thought, I won't be me if I try to behave like that other leader. And so I, need a f I took the feedback. The feedback was people are afraid to tell you what they really think. Mm -hmm. So I needed to fix that problem. I needed to, I needed to listen better. But I couldn't, I tried going into meetings and just being utterly silent. And it, <laughs> it didn't, didn't work for me. And people still weren't telling me what they thought. And so this, this HR person said, why don't you try going in and telling them to do some, telling your team to do something ridiculous and just see if they, if anybody pushes back. Because I didn't, her assessment, the HR person's assessment was that I was intimidating. But I'm short, blonde, and Southern. I had mm -hmm. spent my whole career fighting to be taken seriously. I just didn't believe the problem was that I was intimidating. But I, I was prepared to acknowledge there could be a problem. And so I told them to do this ridiculous thing and nobody pushed back. So I realized the HR person was right. Yeah. And so I, I had to figure out how can I get people. So I confessed what I had done. I said, I know this is impossible. Why didn't you all push back on me? And people had some, some advice. And, and I realized that in my case, what I needed to do was sort of state my position in the way that I like to say it. But then say, OK, now I want you to state your position equally as flamboyantly. And that didn't always work for people either because they needed to, they were quiet. They needed to, to be able to communicate in their style. So then I tried saying, okay, we're gonna switch roles. And so you state my position, I'll state your position. And then they're stating my position very quietly and I'm stating their position very flamboyantly. Mm -hmm. But that, that worked too. I think Johnny Ive said something really wonderful. Uh, Johnny Ive, who's the, the chief design officer at Apple, said something very wonderful about leadership. And he said, one of your most important jobs as a leader is to give the quiet ones a voice. And so I realized that, that I needed not only to let my own voice be heard, but to make room. So another simple thing I would do in meetings is just go around the table and make sure that people got, got, got airtime. But that, for me, was loud listening. I could be loud, but I couldn't be the only one talking. Uh, everybody had to talk about the same amount of time in the way that was most comfortable for them. I think the other idea here that you had said in the book, Steve Jobs is a lion. If he roars at you, roar back, but only if you're a lion, too. Otherwise, he'll eat you for lunch. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, uh, Steve Jobs was a classic loud listener. Yeah, and uh, and and Tim Cook was a very quiet is a very quiet listener, in in my observation anyway. And and they worked very very well together. So it's possible to have both on a team as long as everyone is is gets a voice. And I think when you re when you think about your job as the leader to make sure everybody is talking about the same amount of time it really changes the way you conduct yourself and the way you lead meetings for youtube only i'd love to hear about how we use radical candor between races and genders and that'll be on youtube only if you go to our youtube channel jordanharbinger.com/youtube is where you can find that thank you very much for doing the interview i really appreciate it Thank you. Thank you for reading the whole book. Yeah, I read the whole tell book. you really read it. And it was a fun conversation. So what consideration should we actually be doing and using when we try to use radical candor between races and genders? Because right now it seems almost dangerous. I think there's a, a vibe that you shouldn't, I mean, you have to tread so lightly between races and genders now that I think not only is radical candor not happening, but people are almost like, I don't even want to be in the same elevator because something might happen or I might get in trouble. It's such an important question. And in fact, a lot of the feedback I've gotten since Radical Candor was published two years ago is that the, the topics on which we most need Radical Candor, 
but are least likely to get it mm -hmm. are around race and gender. So, so it's in fact, this is the topic of my whole next book, Radical oh, wow. Reconciliation. So one of the things that I think we need to do is to begin to build stamina for these conversations. And yet it is so difficult to even know how to start them. And one of, one of the favorite things I've done in my whole career is to work with Second City Works, the improv group sure. in Chicago where Tina Fey and uh, all these great funny people came from. And we use radical candor to teach improv and we use improv to teach radical candor because these moments where somebody says something that's so incredibly offensive that you can't believe it right. uh, are so difficult to manage. And yet radical candor really is the way out of those moments. How can we address those moments with a little bit of agency and a little bit of grace where you show that person who said the offensive thing that you see them as a full human being. You're not threatening to send them through the wood chipper because they said <laughs> this ridiculous thing, but you're, you're not gonna let the moment pass. Your silence will not protect you. Claudia Rankine talks about this really well in her book, An American Lyric, where, and there's a refrain in the book, what did he just say? What did she just say? Did that come out of my mouth, his mouth, her mouth? The moment stinks. So how can we use radical candor to manage these moments. One of the first times I experienced one of those moments was in my very first job, my very first internship. So picture me, I'm, uh, it's 1985, I'm in my shoulder pads, I got my wings, and I'm standing by the elevator at this bank, and one of the executives comes up and he says to me, it's a bank in Memphis, Tennessee, he says to me, what are you doing here, Kim? And I said to him, I'm an intern here this summer. And he looks at me and he says, oh, I didn't know they let us hire pretty interns. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, I, and I'm 18 and I don't know what to say. So fast forward 30 years, I'm writing the, the follow-up book to Radical Candor and I'm describing the scene and I'm trying to think what I should have said and I still can't think of the yeah. radically candid response. It's so hard. And so I put it out there on social media and I had all these funny responses. My father said, you should have told him to eat shit and die, you know, so that's obnoxious. Yeah, that's how you get an offer, yeah. Uh, I don't know, it might have worked. Maybe, you never know. Yeah. But probably not what I was gonna say. A lot of people said, I never know what to say in those moments, uh, and so I don't say anything and then I tell everybody what an asshole he was, you know, typical uh, manipulative insincerity. Other people say, well, you don't wanna make him feel awkward, he probably didn't mean it that way so you don't say anything. Classic ruin of sympathy. Right. And it was a, a man who I work with who bore a lot of the same superficial characteristics of the guy who said the thing, sort of older white male. And he said, you know, first of all, thank you for telling me the story because it is, I'm sure I've done stuff like that and it's so helpful for me mm. to know how that lands for the other person. Sure. And he said, the thing you could have said that would have stopped me in my tracks was, what you just said breaks my heart because it makes me think I'll never be taken seriously here and I can't build my career in my hometown. Which of course was exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. And that would have been the radically candid response, but I couldn't think of it in the moment. And I realized that if we can practice these moments, then we can get it right the next time. Because that was not the last time something like that was ever sure. said to me. It was like, probably happened every other day for the rest of my career. And so that's why we're working, Radical Candor is working with Second City Works to practice these moments. And so we, we bring together people and they bring in the kind of most offensive thing anybody ever said to them in their careers. And boy, people come in with some doozies. And we bring in these, these improv actors and the improv actors play with the scenarios and try to think of responses and then other people. And we use radical candor as the framework to guide us to the right answer. It's one of the most fun, but also powerful things I've ever done in my career. Thanks, Ken. Thank you.